Yesterday we observed the last day of, uh, of unleavened bread, and during the whole week we all had leavening out of our homes and we ate unleavened bread every day. And we did that to worship our God. And we want to do everything that we can to stay close to God. And we want to do things that please Him. God had taught, told Adam and Eve from the very beginning. He taught them His commandments, the laws and the rules that He wanted uh, them to live by along with the, all of us. And then later on, He gave Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai where He codified them and uh, God wrote the Ten Commandments on uh, two tablets of stone and he used that so it wouldn't deteriorate and that we would have his commandments from that time on. God wants us to obey him and he also wants us to to get along with our fellow men. So I want to talk about that today. Uh, in Matthew 22, verse 36, let's turn there. We'll begin. At this particular time, there were the different followers of Jesus, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and you know, other multitudes were following Jesus, but they weren't following him to understand what he was teaching. They were looking for decrepancies in what he said, and they, they were testing him on almost everything that he said. And we can begin reading in verse 36. Hearing that Jesus had silenced, I'm reading out of the new, uh, Revised Standard Version, uh, New International Version. He says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, and he had, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, they had asked him some questions about that. He said, the, uh, one of the experts in the law, probably one of the lawyers, tested him with this question, said, Teacher, which, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. And we'll see in other places that it says with all your strength. Four different things that he wants us to, uh, t teach us how to love him. He said in the first and the greatest commandment, that was the first and greatest commandment, but the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and the prophets hang on these, these two commandments. Oh, the first commandment of loving God, whether your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, is a spiritual commandment. It deals more with spirituality than, than physical things. But the one where you have to love your neighbor, that's mostly physical, even though there's a spiritual aspect to it. And that's what I want to talk about today, loving your neighbor as yourself. In fact, I want to break it down into three parts. I want to focus on uh, loving our neighbors and I want to read some of the laws that God had given to ancient Israel that dealt with your neighbor and how to treat your neighbor. And a second thing I want to review is I want to re review some examples that have shown a love and concern that others had for their neighbor. And a third part I want to show what we must do to improve our relationship with our neighbor and that we need to grow uh, and improve our relationships with our neighbor. Uh, we're supposed to love everyone and uh, we'll go through some of those things. Uh, I'll just mention that uh, in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, I didn't realize that he had used that way you have loved your neighbor way back in Old Testament times. I thought that was just the New Testament where he came out with those two commandments. But in Leviticus 19 verse 18, he says, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. So I just wanted to bring that in as a, uh, just something that you would uh, know. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I went through all the, I went through the uh, concordance and I went through every uh, scripture that mentioned neighbors. Uh, what the S was just neighbor by itself. It had four or five different uh, words that I looked up and I read every 
every verse that dealt with the neighbor and stuff like that. And it was very, very interesting. And some time ago in our Bible study, we went through some of the laws in Exodus 21, 22, and Leviticus 19 and all that, dealing with some of the laws that governed the way they had to live back in those days. And I want to, go, I want to look at some of that today. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, we'll start reading verse 1. He said, the, 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 and it's titled in my Bible, Love the Lord your God. It says, these are the commands and the decrees and the laws the Lord your God directs me to teach you to observe the, in the land that you are going into in your Jordan. So that you and your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping the de decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy a long life. Dropping down to verse 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are uh, to be upon your hearts. He says, impress them on your children and talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down, when you get up, all the time. Have a steady conversation with your children and teach them about God and God's laws. I know my wife and I did that when I was children. Uh, every day we talked and we asked questions to one another. And on Sabbaths when we'd hear a sermon or something like that, we'd go back and uh, since I was in a spokesman club at the time, we'd have to ask our children what the subject was you know, from a specific purpose statement that we were taught in the club and stuff like that. And we would, even when they were real small, maybe four or five years old, we, we got them to talk about what did you get out of the, out of the sermon. They, they would tell us every time they didn't necessarily get the message that was, was given, but they had, you know, they had the thing to say that what they liked about it, what they didn't like, and that kind of thing. But you got to make God a major factor in your life and in the lives of your children. And they'll, they'll make some mistakes along the way, just like we made mistakes. But they learn to love God. I, I told this one time too. Uh, uh, my wife was standing in line at one of the grocery stores, and uh, this man was standing there smoking a cigarette. My little girl might have been three or four. She said, "God said, 'Don't thou shalt not, thou shalt don't smoke.'" <laughs> <laughs> so the children are aware of, of what we believe. Let's continue on in the. Turn to Exodus chapter 22. Uh -oh. Yeah, I think it's oh, Exodus 21. We'll begin to read some of these, uh, these laws. Most of these are going to deal with judicial type situations. And we realize that God believes in capital punishment. Exodus 21 and verse 12, we'll begin there. It says, anyone who strikes a man and kills him that he shall surely be put to death, especially if it's premeditated. However, if he does not do it intentionally, uh, but God lets it happen, he is to flee to a place that I will designate. They had cities of refuge. If you accidentally kill someone, you could go to that city. We will read a scripture a little bit further into the sermon that, that I mean, the sermon that there were three different cities that. Uh, was set up as refuge cities where an individual got in an accident or something like that, someone was killed, he would have to flee to that city so he would be safe, he could live there. And the family that uh, were related to the person that was, was killed could go around that city. If he left that city, they had the right to kill him. So they stayed in, in that refuge, that refuge city, you know, so that they wouldn't lose their death. And sometimes they, uh, had the opportunity to, to give a portion of money to the family in restitution for the death. We might read that too. I, I know I got it in one of these things. Uh, he says in fifth, verse 15, anyone who attacks his father or mother must be put to death. 
anyone who kidnaps another and either sells him or uh, still has him, when he is caught, he must be put to death. Anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. So you want to teach your children when they're young <laughs> the consequences of, of what they do. If men quarrel with one another or one, and one hits the other with a stone or with his fist and he does not die but is confined to bed, the one who struck the blow will not be held responsible. If the, if, if the other gets up and walks around outside with his, his staff, however, he must pay the injured man for the loss of his time and you know, he'd have to make restitution for the damage that he's done. If a man beats his male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies as the direct result, he must be punished. But he is not punished if the slave gets up after a day or two since the, the slave was his property. It's kind of unusual. Since the slave was what belonged to him, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have to pay a penalty if that individual was, wasn't killed. If a man who, who are fighting hits a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely and there's no, no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. If there's serious injury, you ought to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, and wound for wound, bruise for bruise. That'd be tough to live in that, that type of situation. You have to be careful what you do. It says, if a man hits a manservant or a maidservant in the eye and destroys it, he must let the servant go free to compensate for the eye. And if he knocks out a tooth, manservant, maidservant, he must let the servant go free to compensate for losing that tooth. If a bull gores a man to uh, a woman, to death, the bull must be stoned to death, and its meat must not be eaten. But the owner of the bull will not be held responsible. But if the, if the bull had a habit of goring, uh, the owner had been warned but had not kept it penned up, and it kills a man or woman, the bull must be stoned and the owner also must be put to death. So you, you had to take care of your, your cattle, make sure you uh, animals and stuff, make sure that they didn't get loose and do damage. One law that pertains to us today in verse 33, it says, if a man uncovers a pit or he digs, he digs one and, and falls, fails to cover it and an ox or a donkey falls into it or the owner of the pit must pay for the, for the lost. He must pay its owner and the dead animal will be his. If you have a hole in your backyard and some kids are playing, they're running, one falls in that hole, you're going to be responsible for his injuries. That's what the law says today. So we have similar laws. Uh, if, you, if you have some kind of dangerous situation on your property, you'll be held responsible. Uh, some people sometimes stretch a wire for a certain reason and forget to pick it up and somebody runs playing hide or seek or whatever and get hung up in it. that wire, you're responsible for that injury. Taking care of your neighbor. Verse 22, if a man steals an, an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for a sheep. Why do they make that type of difference? Well, an ox is, is like a tool. You use it for your occupation, you make it for work. So you, if you steal a tool or uh, an ox, you have to pay five times in restitution. I think that's a good law. And if it was a sheep, oh, you don't use sheep as a, you know, a tool necessarily, but you ought only pay four times that price. I wish they still had that type of law. If someone steals from you, they need to make restitution. Usually, the one who is the, the, the victim uh, doesn't get very much for what, what happened to him. I find these, these things interesting. I like to read through some of those. It said in verse 7 of ver, uh, chapter 22, 
If a man gives his neighbor silver or goods for safekeeping, and they are stolen from their neighbor's house, the thief, if he is caught, must pay back double. But if the thief is not found, the owner of the house must appear before the judge to determine whether if he had laid his hand on the other man's property. In all cases, all illegal possessions, now this is a different, different situation. Uh, talking about if, if, if they steal that silver, he would have to pay double. <clears throat> the victim would, would make that money, which is, I think, fair. Uh, but if, if they didn't find the money or didn't uh, convict the individual, they would have to go before a judge, and he would have to make judgment. Verse 10 says, if a man gives a donkey or an ox or a sheep or any animal to his neighbor for safekeeping and it dies or is injured or is taken away while no one is looking, the issue between them will be settled by taking of an oath before the Lord and that the neighbor did not lay hands on the, the person's property. The owner is to accept this with no restitution required. But if the animal was stolen from the neighbor, he must make restitution to the owner. If it was torn in pieces, then he would have to bring the remains as evidence, and uh, he would have to uh, he would not have to pay for the torn animal. If a man borrows an animal from his neighbor and is injured or dies while the owner is present or not present, he must make restitution. But if the owner is there with him, the borrower will not have to pay. If the animal was hired, the money paid for the hire covers that loss. And just uh, multiple different situations like that. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter uh, chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. We have a few more. I want to read verses 41 through 43. This is about the cities of refuge that I spoke of. It said, Moses set aside three cities east of the Jordan to which anyone who had killed a person could, be, could flee if he unintentionally killed his neighbor while malice or forethought. He could flee into the, one of these cities and save his life. The cities were Bezer in the desert plateau for Reubenites, Ramoth in Gilead for the Gadites, and Golan in Bashan for the Manassites. So there were three different cities that they chose as refuge cities where you could go uh, to escape being killed by uh, one of your neighbors who, uh, you know, had wrong done to him. If you had killed uh, one of the relatives, you would have that city to go to. Let's continue on in Proverbs 3. All laws dealing with situations that deal with your neighbor. Proverbs 3, and we'll read verses 27 and 28. This is a lesson that this is a principle that we need to know. It said, do not hold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to act. And do not say to your neighbor, well, if he's wanting something or need your help, to come back later, I'll give it to you tomorrow. If, you, if your neighbor comes seeking help and you have the means, God says you have to give it. Don't make him come back. And many of us have that. You know, to have the example where a man wants to get some bread and the guy wouldn't give him the bread and then later on he decided to do it, but he should have given it to him when he needed it. So we have we have situations that happen like that in our lives. Uh, sometimes individuals are borrowers and they never they never buy anything for themselves. They borrow everything, and that can get a little bit frustrating from time to time. Proverbs chapter fourteen, verse forty.
Okay, we go 14, 14 verse 20, not no 40. It says we need to be aware of this. The poor are shunned even by their neighbors, but the rich have many friends. So we need to be aware of that and be uh, receptive to helping out the poor. He who despises his neighbor sins, but blessed is he who is kind to the needy. We ought to have an open ear, an eye watching to help those who are needy. James chapter 2. In verse verse 8. Speaking about the royal law. He says, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. God is telling us we should not be respecters of people. We should help out our neighbor, you know, any time we have the opportunity. And a lot of us are, are always willing to help somebody out. We're just looking for the opportunity. But we need to, we need to know, learn how to develop that. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we'll read verses 1 through 8. The New International Version heading has imitating Christ's humility. It says, if you have an encouragement from being united with Christ, and if it's any comfort for, from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion... Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only unto his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ. I want to read that to King James. You who are following that, the King James, it talks about esteeming others better than yourselves. I'm going to read the same thing in the King James, um, starting in verse 3 this time. It says, let, the, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. And look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you which also in Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. It's worded a little different in the Revised Standard, and it says, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider the equality with God. Jesus Christ did not consider himself to be equal with God the Father. He, he said, but he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. That's the attitude we need to have when we deal with our neighbor. We need to realize that we're not better than they are. We need to esteem them better than ourselves. I want to list some specific ways that we need to esteem others, uh, how to esteem others better than ourselves. Number one is don't assume that others have the same evil motives and thoughts that you find in your own heart. That's a shock. But Jeremiah tells us, it said, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? We have those bad thoughts from time to time. 
We need to be careful that we don't let it stay in our mind. We need to just let it, let it go right on through. A second one says, look for virtues, virtuous qualities in others that know you are most in need of. And then seek their help in acquiring those qualities. Spend time with others who have strengths in areas that you are lacking. Iron sharpens iron. Choose your friends wisely. And look for qualities in individuals. And then spend some time with them because those good qualities will rub off on you if you pay attention. I know through the years I've been in the church, I, I had close relationships with almost all the ministers that came through because we, we did some fishing and hunting and you know some of the uh, outdoor things that they never had the opportunity to do before. So even when I didn't even seek their company, it ended up where we, we, we did a lot of things together. And if it wasn't doing that, we were out working on roofs or you know, just manly things. And uh, I spent a lot of time uh, with the ministry and I learned a lot from them. Uh, you know, some special ones uh, set a good example all the time. I don't know how they had such control over themselves. But if you spend that time with them, you know, you start picking up some of those things. <laughs> it, it's quite a help. So we need to do that. We need to, we need to try to spend time with those who have stronger qualities in some areas than we do. And like I said, the iron sharpens iron. A third point is, don't assume that your time and your money and your energy and your thoughts and your opinions are more valuable than your neighbors. Don't always think that you have the answers. And don't always feel like you've got to put your two cents in and everything. You know, sometimes, sometimes we think, oh, that's, I know better than that. And then they tell you a story about why, why you know more than what that situation called for. But God says not to do that. A fourth quality is that when you're making a decision, consider not only how the decision will affect you, but how it's going to affect the people around you. You've got to take time and, and think. And sometimes we don't do that. Sometimes we just are like a bull in the china closet. We just boil through and don't want to do what we want. Because my opinion is right. But we need to think about others. You don't want to hurt other individuals. And find another way around what you have to do. Number five, be alert not only for your own needs, but for the needs of others. See the big picture. And sometimes we just uh, almost have tunnel vision. We just, we want something so bad that we just, we're going to get it. We're going to get it one way or the other. And you set that as a goal. And... That the hide and the hair go where you gotta go, and you, you do what you wanna do. But we, we don't need to have that attitude. We need to be alert of the needs of others. A sixth way is demonstrate your high, a high estimation of others by commending them for their qualities. You know, praise them for the good things they do. If they're doing something that's biblically correct, biblically, biblically correct then you need to follow through with it and, and, and tell them they, that they are, are doing good, they impressed you or whatever. Give them a compliment. Uh, incur that encourages uh, much goes a long way. We all have so much to learn. Uh, don't allow yourself to be critical, uh, uh, condemnatory or even accusatory of others. And don't be judgmental. You know, I'll let individuals do things the way they know how to do it. Your way is not always right. Let them do it their way. It might, might be the same, the outcome might not be exactly the same, but it's acceptable. So don't always think that your way is better. And as the scripture says, esteem others better than yourselves. If you do that, you're not gonna have that problem. You're not gonna think that, oh, I can do that better than this, this guy can do it. Another thing that we need to do, and I, I think we do this from time to time, but we need to pray for one another. But we also need to have a, a close enough relationship with others to be able to consider praying. 
Uh, that's where we fall short. I don't think we have close enough relationships. In, in our group, we are family. We ought, to, we ought to know the names of everyone in this group, in this room. And we need to, we need to talk to them from time to time. We ought to have a relationship with one another. And not very many of us will know the names of everybody in the room. We need to work on that. That's, that's some goal that we should have for uh, this coming year. Next Passover, you look back and see how much you applied yourself to try to get to know your brothers and your sisters spiritually. Spiritual brothers and sisters. God wants us to, to consider this. We want to be in a kingdom. And God said these are the two greatest commandments. And we, we, we have a spiritual connection with God. And we're keeping his laws and doing the things that he commands us to do. But we're not making much effort toward uh, loving your, your, your brethren. Loving your neighbor. We, we need to seriously consider this and uh, set it as a goal. They have a saying, if, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. So we need to plan, uh, set a goal of, of uh, getting to know one another and spending time with one another. And remind yourself often that God has given you everything you have to be proud of or pleased with, but he used others to get you to that point. You didn't get it on your own. He sent others to help you to get where you are. Thank God for those that he has used to bless you. We need to consider those things. We need to think about that, meditate on those type of things. There was a time that I thought that uh, living in the rural area, you'd have a better uh, opportunity to get to know your neighbor and love your neighbor and spend time with your neighbor because, uh, you know, different things we do in a, in a country, you have a little bit more room uh, some do a lot of gardening. Uh, we do some fishing. We take people out on fishing trips or hunting. Or we get involved with ball games and stuff when we were young. And we were always doing all some kind of activity in the neighborhood. And the houses weren't jam-packed right on one top of one another, so you had room to play. And the kids from the neighborhood would come and play. So we had, a, we had an opportunity to, to, to meet a lot of people and have a good relationship with them. So I, I kind of thought that we had an advantage by, by doing that, but this world is changing. You know, people now are gathering together in, in uh, apartment buildings and uh, condos and all this stuff, so they don't have to maintain grass and, you know, they're looking for the easy way out or whatever. Uh, when you get elderly, you can't do all the physical things that you did when you were younger. They have a different set of uh, situations. But they also have the opportunity to get to know one another. It's, in an article I was reading, it said 50% of apartment residents don't have any friends in their community. They're lonely people. And if there's groups that get together to go visit them, you know, like missionaries have a, an idea or have a, a goal of uh, going and visit nursing homes and different things like that. Well, they're trying to get together and help these people to to step out of their comfort zone and get to meet other people. Sort of like what I'm doing right now, trying to uh, encourage us to, to get out of our comfort zone and spend time with our neighbor. And it, it, there are different kinds of ways of doing it. Now, one particular man, I read a story about one particular man who uh, was off of work one day and had a snowstorm in the area. So he just made some, uh, some chocolate, hot chocolate, and he went out in the neighborhood the people were stranded with their cars and all that kind of stuff, and he went out and delivered hot chocolate to everybody that was stranded. And uh, naturally, they had the news people there, so they took pictures of it, and he was on the national news because he was being a good neighbor. Well, we need to do that whether people see us or not. They, they had a list of different things that they said we needed to do, and I'll go through that pretty quick. It says, invite one another over for dinner each month. If someone is new in town, invite them to uh, join in your plan for the weekend. Organize a walking group, uh, a foot running club. These are things that we can do, too. When someone tells you 
they have an upcoming job interview or a test or a doctor's appointment, mark it on your calendar. And then follow up on the big day after with a note of encouragement and let them know that you're praying for them and ask them how it went afterwards. Better, better yet, they said, do both. And if, if we pay attention and show people that we care, you know, it'll make a difference in their life. And then they might even begin to, begin to wonder why you like that. They might want to, you know, get a little bit more information with you. And, I mean, build bonds and stuff. Uh, others said, uh, ask your neighbor to be their friend on Facebook. Said it's a great way to find common ground and things to talk about the next time you see them. Practice a, uh, random acts of kindness. Take your neighbor's trash out from time to time. Or put, or put the can, trash cans back after the pickup, uh, the garbage truck picked them up. Mow their lawn just because. You know, we can, we, there's a lot of things that we can do. And you don't have to be all that uh, inventive. There's a lot of different physical things that uh, our neighbors need from time to time. We just have to be alert to that and be looking for, for ways to, to love our neighbor. Some say use your, use your kids as an icebreaker. Invite, invite a fellow mom and her kids over for the, uh, a play date and get to know her over a tall glass of iced tea. And just talking about stepping out and in, in, in finding ways to, to help one another. One lady decided to, to start inviting uh, someone new to her house for a meal once a month. And her goal was to have something like 500 different friends. I don't know if she ever made the whole 500, but she was well on her way. And they, they got a write up about her. I want to ask, what, what should motivate us to be a good neighbor? Let's turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. I'll get there sooner or later. And we're going to read uh, verses 17 and 18. We'll read verse 16 too. He said, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone, anyone has material possession and sees his brother in need and has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. We need to consider that. If we have material blessings, and we do have material blessings compared to other people in the world, we need to be willing to share that with others. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, uh, we'll begin reading in verse 25, it starts. Talking about the Good Samaritan, it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. And he said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Christ answered him, and he said, What is, the, what is written in the law? How do you read it? The individual answers, love the Lord your God with your whole heart, and with your whole mind, and with your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Christ answered, he said, uh, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify him, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And a man would use that example. Um, 
I'm not seeing what I want. He said a man was going uh, down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he, he fell into the hands of robbers. And they stripped him of his clothes and they beat him and went away leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down. This is the story of the Good Samaritan. Said a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, a Levite of the priesthood, and when he came by the place and saw him, he passed from the other side also. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, he came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, and he bandaged his wound, pouring on oil and wine. And he put the man on his own donkey and took him uh, to an inn and took care of him. The next day, means he spent the night there. The next day, he took the two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper and told him, look after him. And I, when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you have. And Christ asked, which of these do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? And naturally, man said to the one who had mercy on him. Christ said, go ahead and do likewise. If that, if that was you, would you have walked on the other side of the street? Would you have responded to help that individual? I asked myself that question. I hope that I would. But I also know that I'm not one just to jump into something without knowing what's going on. I would like to know exactly what had happened. I would be a little bit uh, reticent to just jump right on in. I know that when they have traffic fatalities, or, or not just fatalities, but accidents and stuff like that, and I happen to be in a neighborhood where I'm close enough to it, I always try to see what's going on. I'm willing to help and do anything I possibly can, but I usually wait for somebody else to go first and I'll go assist them. That's the way I would prefer to do it. That might not be the right way to do it, but I know that's the way I am. And uh, probably I need to change that. And I just asked myself, suppose I was there when this robber was injured, would I have rushed to his aid right, right away? I, like I say, I wish I would, but I'm not sure if I would have done that or not. That's something I need to pray about and try to figure out whether I would have done it or not. I'm, I know I would be willing to assist him. I'd be willing to spend the money to help him out. I'd spend my time with him. You know, I know I would do all of that kind of thing, but I don't know if I would be want to be the first one to be there. It's kind of a peculiar feeling, but um, I have to talk to God about that, about having deeper compassion, I guess. But we need to make changes. Uh, we all have different situations that we're affected by. I will notice there were three things that, that took place there. The Samaritan saw someone in need and he had compassion on him. And he went to his aid and uh, he could have did just like the, the Levite and uh, the priest. He could have easily just walked by and just went about his business because he had things to do. But he didn't. He took time out to, to help out his, his brother, his neighbor. And it says that Samaritan temporarily put his needs on hold so that he could assist the man who needed the help. And he was willing to stay there a whole night to be with him and to help him. And he did it quietly. He wasn't looking for praise or honor or anything like that. It takes humility to be a good neighbor. And sometimes we lack uh, humility. We ought to be more humble than what we are. We need to consider the needs of others before we consider our needs in time. And be willing to, to do whatever we can to, to help one another out. And like I said, you have to plan to, to do things to get involved. Uh, one of the scriptures, I think it's in Romans, that talks about using hospitality. We need to be more hospitable. Uh, I know I used to, uh, we used to have fish fries and Bible studies at my house. And we had people at my house all the time. I, I enjoyed that kind of a thing. 
I'm looking, I'm doing some uh, renovations on my patio and I'm closing it in, but when I get it fixed, I plan on having a group over, have, have some barbecue, or, uh, put some hamburgers and hot dogs on the grill or whatever, and uh, having people over, invite people over to spend some time and get to know one another a little bit better. When you're outside the church atmosphere, it does a difference. You know, when you when you just uh, in your regular clothes and doing different things, you you uh, you build a bond, spend the time with one another, and we need to do that. We need to use hospitality to draw us closer to one another, and make changes in how we we uh, get together and, and uh, get to know one another. God wants us to do that, and like I said before, if if you want to show love for your neighbor, you have to plant it. Sometimes it's spontaneous and it's just automatic. But a lot of times we, we're not busy doing anything. And God says, if you want to be in the kingdom, keep the commandments. And this is the major uh, commandment. The one loving God is 40% of the commandments. The one loving your neighbor is 60% of the commandments. Six out of ten. So, you know, these are things that, that uh, I, I think about often. Uh, and I know I, I need to work on it too because I'm not one that just walks up to different people, people I don't know, and just start a conversation. Uh, I can do that after we talk a few times, but uh, I'm not just that aggressive or whatever, but we need to work on ourselves. We need a plan to, to make changes. So this year, let's, make a, let's make, set some goals and... Uh, Make a promise that we're going to get to know our neighbors better and show more love to them.